Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is September 26th, uh, 2019. And as always, we're very excited to bring to you another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, today, we are continuing with the series that we began um, several years ago. Uh, the series is on interviewing people from other religious traditions about their uh, their awakening or their discoveries, their faith crises or whatever you call it, and their journeys out of their respective religious traditions and into uh, whatever new life they've built for themselves. Many of you will remember interviewing Tova Mirvis, the ex uh, ex uh, Orthodox Jew, uh, about her book, uh, the Book of Separation. We've interviewed Lloyd Evans, uh, ex Jehovah's Witness, along with Amber Scora. Uh, author of the book, Leaving the Witness, and um, probably others as well, including Stephen Hassan, uh, an ex-Mooney who's a cult expert. Uh, today, we are super excited to be interviewing Chris Shelton. Um, it's going to be probably the first of a two-part interview with Chris. Uh, Chris Shelton is an ex-Scientologist, and he is also a YouTuber and a blogger and uh, an author, and there's a lot of cool things about Chris. Uh, and we're today we're going to be covering a brief history of Scientology, and then we're going to bring Chris back to talk about his story specifically. Um, but before we do that, I just want to make one quick uh, public service announcement. For those of you who don't know yet, uh, we are trying to do something really important uh, here on Mormon Stories. Uh, we are partnering with the Thrive Organization, uh, which is an organization that's dedicated to uh, healing, growth, and community for uh, people who have either left Mormon Orthodoxy or have left the Mormon Church. So November 17th, 2019, uh, Salt Lake City, it's on a Sunday. We're going to be bringing Amber Scora um, from New York to Salt Lake uh, to have her speak to us. We're going to have, uh, we're going to be bringing Wayne Sermon, the lead guitarist for Imagine Dragons. Uh, we're going to have several other cool speakers. We're going to be having an all-day conference with hopefully 4,000 of you, because that's the maximum capacity. And it is going to be a, uh, think of it as like a general conference for ex-Mormons. It's going to be uh, inspiring speakers and music and community and uh, friendship and maybe even karaoke, uh, all focused on positivity, focused on healing from uh, leaving Mormonism and finding growth and health and well-being and community after Mormonism. And we hope you and all your friends will come. Uh, we've priced it uh, at a loss. We won't be making any money from this event. In fact, we'll likely be losing several thousand dollars uh, from this event. And that's if several thousand of you show up. But we've priced the event at $15 a person. We want everyone to come. It's a full day of amazing talks. We'll be sharing the lineup of the full speaker list soon, but it's an amazing group of people. Hans and Birgitta Matson are coming. Stephanie Sorensen Larson, Christian Moore, Natasha Alfred Parker. I'm going to speak. Margie will be there. It's going to be an amazing day. Um, but uh, if you want to sign up now, please go to thrivebeyondmormonism.com. You can sign up. Uh, please tell all your friends and family. Please register as soon as you can so we can know that we're going to have at least enough people uh, to justify the event. We've got about 300 that have signed up already, pre registered, and we need about uh, 3,700 more. So please spread the word. It's going to be amazing. And uh, again, thrivebeyondmormonism.com is the website. So without any further ado, uh, we are so thrilled and excited to uh, be bringing Chris Shelton on to Mormon Stories. I've known of Chris's work for at least uh, a year or two. We've been in dialogue for way too long about trying to get Chris on Mormon Stories. And finally, he's here. Uh, Chris is a former Scientologist, uh, a former Sea Org member. We'll be talking about what that means. Um, and he's now an ex-Scientologist. He's a writer, a consultant, podcaster, a YouTuber, and an advocate for critical thinking. We're not going to spoil it by telling you his whole biography, but you should know that he's got an amazing YouTube channel uh, uh, that you should all check out. It's called Critical Thinker at Large. Um, he has a podcast called Sensibly Speaking. His uh, website, what's your website called, Chris? MNCriticalThinking.com. 
Uh, and spell that for us. Uh, M N and then critical thinking. So C R I. What for? It was from it was Minnesota because I used to live in Minnesota when Got I started it. it. Okay. <laughs> M N critical thinker dot com. Critical thinking. Critical thinking dot com. And yes. Chris uh, has been featured. Many of you will be familiar with Leah Remini's uh, A and E series, Scientology in the Aftermath. He was a consultant to that show for the first two seasons. Um, and he's written a book called Scientology A to Zenu, an insider's guide to what Scientology is really all about. And that's available on Amazon and in printed form, ebook and audiobook. So prolific. You've only been out of, uh, you've only been out of Scientology for a few years, right? Yeah, yeah, about six, about five or six, yeah. That's amazing. I'm just in awe, uh, and we're, we're so thrilled to have you on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very thrilled to be on. Anything you want to say about my uh, introduction that I got right or wrong, <laughs> or that you want to add? Yeah, you are you are awesome. My YouTube channel, by the way, is just my name, Chris Shelton. Okay. Um, but yeah, so but otherwise, you were perfect. Nailed it. And you're kind of buds with uh, Jonathan Streeter, right? I am. We just uh, recorded this week a Three Apostates uh, podcast for this weekend with Jonathan and with Lloyd Evans. That's so freaking amazing. And YouTube, <laughs> really within Mormonism, YouTube is really an un, kind of a underutilized resource. I, I've had a YouTube channel for a long time, but I just publish these long form interviews that are five or six hours long, sometimes 12 hours long. But that's not how YouTube is working these days. So there's a lot of uncharted territory in Mormonism and post-Mormonism for YouTube. But it's, it's great to have you on, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. So we want the, when, we, when we interviewed Lloyd Evans, ex-Joe's Witness, we kind of broke up into three parts. The, the three parts were history of the Jehovah's Witness movement, what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe now, and what it's like to be a Jehovah's Witness today. And then I wanted to have Lloyd just tell his own story, which in and of itself was heartbreaking and inspiring. I kind of want to follow a similar format. I don't know how much we're going to get to today, but I want to give at least a good three hours to the history of Scientology to give people a background um, of what we're going to be talking about with what it means to be a Scientologist today, what it means to leave Scientology, and your story. Um, <clears throat> But I'm also going to just give the disclaimer or the acknowledgement that many of my listeners have probably seen uh, the Going Clear documentary, although I'm sure there are many who have not. But uh, if you haven't, that's an amazing documentary that's based on a book by, is it Lawrence Wright? Is that his name? Yes. Pulitzer Prize winning author Lawrence Wright. Yes. Yeah. He's, aw he's awesome. Phenomenal author, phenomenal book, phenomenal documentary. And I'm just hoping we'll be able to sort of, you know, get get a different point of view that was going to incorporate a lot of that stuff, but maybe you've got extra info or insight or personal experience, uh, and we'll be able to dig a little bit deeper because we're not trying to jam it all into an hour and a half or whatever it is. Uh, I, I'm hoping that my listeners will will tune in even if they've heard going clear because I'm guess they're gonna I'm guessing they're gonna get valuable stuff in addition to what they would have heard there. Absolutely. Yeah the going clear goal? Absolutely. Yeah. The, I want to just say right off, since we're talking about that, um, the Going Clear documentary is the best two hours. If you only have two hours and you want to understand Scientology, that is the thing to watch. But you are going to have a thousand questions after you're done with it. So I'm going to try to fill in the blanks on all of that. I love it. So that'll be great. Uh, we're excited. And as always, we are uh, live streaming this episode uh, Jonathan Streeter is already tuning in. Hey, Jonathan, uh, thanks for all your great work. Uh, we've got several people tuned in. Judith is watching from Texas. Laura Lee says you're the best. I don't know if she means you or me. Um, <laughs> Victoria is joining us from the UK. Again, Jonathan Streeter's joined us. And I'm guessing the listenership's going to grow over the next few hours. But the reason why I'm mentioning that one of the main reasons we live stream is to be able to get comments and questions from our listening audience. So if you've got comments or questions or feedback or, or uh, personal anecdotes or whatever, we just want to uh, make sure you feel welcome in sharing. So welcome all our, our, our live stream listeners. We look forward to collaborating with you. Also shout out to Jeannie in Oklahoma, uh, Melissa and everyone else who's joined us. All right. So without any further ado, 
Tell us about L. Ron Hubbard and the founding of Scientology. I am, I cannot get enough of this story. So uh, let's do it. All right, let's get to it. Uh, Lafayette, Ron Hubbard, Ronald Hubbard. So the uh, L stands for Lafayette. I didn't even yes, know that. <laughs> that's right. He was born in 1911, March 13th, 1911. And um, he, I think, until the Nebraska. And uh, he grew up in the Midwest. And uh, he was definitely a Midwest boy, a product of that time. Uh, in the, and by that, I mean that, you know, casual racism was just part of his growing up. Um, he was a, a very flamboyant guy. He was always an attention seeker. Uh, as a child, he had flaming red hair, which made him stand out in a crowd. And he uh, was kind of a lanky guy. And he was into, you know, kind of beating the bush and, and running around and being a wild, wild kind of kid. Uh, he was a Boy Scout and he, and he got around and he had a unique childhood in that he traveled quite a bit. He, um, he traveled to China. Uh, he traveled to Guam. He traveled around, and even as a, as a like um, before before his military service, you mean? Yes, before his military service, as a okay. as a as a minor. Um, in fact, his because his father was in the navy, and um, his father was named uh, Harry Hubbard, and he had been stationed out in Guam. And Hubbard was in school, I think, in Washington State at this point, and uh, I think this was when he was about fourteen or 15, 16 years old, and he just skipped school, got on a boat, and went out to Guam, right? Uh, just took off to San Francisco, figured out how to get on a boat, did so, and has like, hi, Dad. And they're like, what are you doing here? You know, this, this was kind of how he was. And he uh, was always into telling, you know, flamboyant stories. Uh, he, he had a very, very, very active imagination. And he did not, he had a disdain for school. He didn't do well in structured, organized situations. So... Uh, his school grades suffered as a result, but he was always the guy who was on the school newspaper or was on the, you know, uh, I think he had some involvement with sports. I know in college he was involved with the ROTC type program. And uh, so I think he had kind of a, 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 an affinity for the military, which was interesting because he was so non-structured in, in the way he led his life. Uh, and then when the depression hit in the 30s, can I, can I ask he, you a quick question? Can I jump yeah, in? Yeah, absolutely. Was he, was he raised religiously at all? Was he part of a religious tradition that you know of? Not that I know of. It's actually not really talked about very much. And I've sort of got the idea that it wasn't a strongly religious household, perhaps as average or ordinary as any other Midwest, you know, uh, sort of out in Nebraska sort of household, you know, I mean, they might've gone to church, but he never actually commented on it. He had a lot to say in his later years about the uh, problems with organized religion. He was very, very down on it. Uh, he considered the whole thing a big control operation, but uh, he never really talked about having a religious upbringing. Okay. So I don't really know that that was part of his life. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, cool. I was yeah. just curious. Uh, yeah, so I've, I'm just kind of, you know, given a little thumbnail here yeah, no, of, of yeah. his, yeah, of his childhood. And then um, by the Depression years, he was uh, making his way as a writer. He had tried, and I won't get into the, all the details of it because it's, you know, there's a whole bio on this by Russell Miller called Barefaced Messiah that really exhaustively lays all this out. But he, um, by the, uh, he was a writer by the Depression times, and he was writing for uh, fiction and nonfiction. Like he wrote for Sportsman Pilot, and he wrote for, you know, he was a pilot. He liked flying, uh, barnstorming. So he learned how to do that kind of thing, and then he would write about it. And he would write stories based on those kind of experiences. And because he had traveled around in, in Indonesia or, or uh, the, you know, China, um, he had some experiences that other people didn't have. So he would utilize those experiences in his writing, and he got into writing pulp fiction. And that's basically what sustained him through the Depression years. Tell us what that means. I mean, some have heard of the Tarantino movie, but what does pulp fiction right. mean? Pulp fiction was the entertainment, the dime store entertainment of the 1920s and 30s, and, and I think all the way into the 40s, where people would buy magazines filled with stories, and they were printed on pulp paper. They were really cheap. They were like one cent, 10 cents, you know, for a collection of stories. And some of these were serialized stories, and some of them were one-offs. And Hubbard was prolific. He could 
uh, whip out a one, two, even three stories, just staying up all night, banging them out. And he was the kind of writer who pounded them out. Uh, he was a one finger typer, but he could type really, really fast. And he uh, just kind of uh, whipped it out, stuck it in an envelope, sent it to the editor. There was no you know, second drafts and corrections and all that kind of thing. And he was, uh, he had, he was very full of himself as a writer. He told many stories in his lectures in later years about how editors would give him a hard time or other writers would challenge him or give him a hard time. And he would always put him in their place. And his, and it, and, it, and you see signs, uh, from his stories early on that he had a, a temper and he had a fairly vindictive nature. He was not into being criticized. Uh, it was, you know, he thought that what he was doing was was 1000% uh, You know the, the the best work that could be done and and he was a great writer and you look at his Pulp Fiction and I am a writer and Even when I was a Scientologist his Pulp Fiction was kind of difficult for me I, I never got on the 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 fiction uh, Train with Hubbard. I never really liked his Pulp Fiction, and there's a lot of Scientologists who do. I find the dialogue trite, and I find the stories rather, uh, you know, cut and paste. So, um, but he made a living at it, and there's no denying that. And he was creative. He wrote across all genres. He wrote Westerns, he wrote sci-fi, he wrote mystery, he wrote romance. You know, people say he's a sci-fi writer, and they're right, but he was a lot more than that as a writer. And I'm not plugging him, I'm just saying that was <laughs> right. his, that was his deal, you know? Yeah. He was, he was prolific. He didn't really care what he was writing about as long as he was making some money doing it. And he got into social circles with this. There were writer circles. This was kind of a, you know, celebrity circle to be in. And his name was up there. He put his name on covers of magazines and he wrote under many, many uh, pseudonyms as well. He had tons of them. Uh, so, uh, so there actually were valid instances where I think at least once or twice, mag Pulp Fiction magazines were published and they were all his stories <laughs> under different names, right? So anyway, that's how he made his living. And then the war came, World War II came along and he uh, signed up. He wanted to be in military intelligence. That didn't work out uh, for many, many reasons, uh, mostly having to do with his ego. And he, uh, he really is very, very full of himself. He was always that way. And uh, so in the military, and this is and really, I saw, really- I saw in his bio that he, that he tried to apply to the Naval Academy and didn't get in, right? Yeah, he tried to, he actually was an officer in the Navy. I mean, he did, he did get in, but he, um, but he uh, didn't ever see combat, for example. I wanna, I wanna lay this out a little bit because it's important to the later story. This is actually the place where, um, actually I should back up. There actually is something earlier than this. In 1928, Hubbard talks about having gotten a dental surgery and dying during that process. Now, whether he actually died or not, he had some kind of out-of-body experience, and uh, he claimed, and he claimed to die, go to a place, you know, tunnel of light, all that, where he was shown all the mysteries of the universe. They were all laid out like a smorgasbord, he said, and he saw all these answers to all these things, but then he got pulled back. They resuscitated his body and he got pulled back and they tried to make him forget, but he said he didn't forget. And so he came back and he had this epiphany and he thought that he had clued in on a, a secret of the universe or secrets of the universe that would, that in his words, would, uh, once he put it down on, on paper and he wrote this book, would outsell the Bible, would be like bigger than, you know, than anything that had ever come before. This was, this was literally his thinking as a result of this, this uh, incident. And this is in so, 18, looks like it's 1838, which was a few years before the U.S. entered World War II. So just to give people a yes. sense for the, the year around. When yes, happened. correct. He was 20, yeah, 27, I think at the time. Okay. So yeah, 38. And uh, this was the book that was called Excalibur. Or, or the dark sword. And, um, and this book, uh, Hubbard later claimed, we don't have this book. Nobody's, nobody's got it. I know literally two people who have even seen it. Uh, it's up in the archives of the Church of Scientology International and, and, uh, and nobody's seen hide or hair of it. Hubbard later, uh, he, he tried to sell it to a bunch of publishers. Nobody wanted it. And so what he did was he put it away, we, you know, sort of, huh, 
meh. And he, and he walked off in a humph and, and uh, sort of put it away. And then the war happened. And he referred later to this book, Excalibur, and said most of the contents of it have been sort of released in the, in the materials of Dianetics and Scientology. But it was about mankind as a species and, and how we um, interact with other people and, and our secret sort of desires and stuff. And really what I think was it was a big book of Hubbard's projection of his personality onto everybody. But like I said, I haven't read it. So I can't say for sure. But this book was a turning point in L. Ron Hubbard's life. And that's why I'm talking about it. He truly believed, there is no doubt in my mind, that he had hit on something very, very important uh, philosophically. And he thought that he was going to be able to help a, a whole lot of people with this information. He later described it, and this is kind of interesting. Maybe this will give you some insight into, his, into the way he thought about things. He later described it as a book where uh, he called it, he called, he said the reaction you would have to reading this book was going up the pole. And he described it as if you were a two dimensional earthworm or something, and you were on a two dimensional plane, and you were going along, and that's all you could be aware of was two dimensions, and suddenly you ran into a three dimensional pole. You'd bump into it and you'd have no, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell what this thing was because you'd never, you wouldn't have any concept of it. And you, but if you could somehow get a concept of it and go up the pole, you would go from a two dimensional existence to a three dimensional existence. And that obviously would be a life changing event. And that's what he described uh, people would have the experience of when they would read this book. Except, of course, for the publishers who passed on it, right? <laughs> they didn't have that. <laughs> so, never talked about them, right? He only talked about these other people, right? So, anyway, he, uh, I know for, sh I, I really feel very strongly that, that, that he felt that was a very pivotal moment in his life. But not getting the reception that he wanted, he uh, kind of said, well, fine, you can't have it then. And he locked it away and, and didn't really talk about it too much anymore. He said later on also that the Russians heard about this and that they stole a copy of it from him. But uh, that's pretty much just, you know, nonsense. There's really no evidence at all to back up his claims and lots of contradictory evidence to it, actually. So, uh, so that happened in 38. Then the war happens. And after can I, the can war... Can I just say two things? Yes. The... You know, I always try and pull parallels back to Mormonism and other religious traditions and a couple parallels I'm seeing uh, with Joseph Smith. And I don't know if L. Ron Hubbard kind of grew up in poverty or not, but, you know, religions often start with someone writing a book. And <clears throat> oftentimes religious start with some claim to an epiphany, some type of transcendent experience, which no one will ever really know no one will ever, it's impossible for anyone to know whether or not the experience really happened. But there's often a high probability that the person who claimed to have that experience, maybe really thought they did have some sort of experience. Now how they how accurate they were about describing it and how much they committed fraud or other things later is a separate thing. But it's sounding like you're saying that L. Ron Hubbard, not only, you know, claimed to have some sort of transcendent experience, but that he that he really believed he did, and that his core motive was kind of to help humanity. Is that all fair to say? I would say that all of those things are true, but there are many, many, many um, other factors that also enter into the picture, which and we that's will develop. What makes it so fun, yeah. That's right, exactly. Okay. And okay. by the way, he and Hubbard, by the way, did not grow up in poverty. He had a comfortable existence. Um, you know, it was Midwest. It was out, you know, in the frontier and stuff. And he he uh, did a lot of traveling, like I said. But he he didn't really suffer for anything or need for or want for anything as a child growing up. And uh, he came from a big family, very supportive. It wasn't just his mother and father. His aunts were around. His grandfather was around. There were, you know, it was a it was a tight family. So. Um, uh, which, of course, was the exact opposite of what Hubbard did later, but that was how he grew up. He didn't really have an abnormal or strange childhood that we can tell from the records and documents and testimonials. So, okay, uh, okay so World War II uh, was another pivotal thing because um, Hubbard got into a uh, command situation. He was a warded officer rank, and he was given command of a vessel. 
Um, he went out to Australia and screwed around there for a little while, but they basically kicked him out. There's a lot of details to all of this and I'm not going to get into, but he was um, a, what, what we would describe as a very egotistical individual. So he bucked command and he bucked orders and he, and he didn't get along well with others. He didn't play well with others um, often. And this, this ran into, this ran him into a lot of trouble. Uh, and he would misrepresent all of this later on, of course, but this was the fact of the matter, according to all the military records we've dug up. Um, he claimed, for example, that he went over to Australia and he was like the first United States, you know, officer over there or something. And he, he single handedly repelled, you know, some kind of invasion force or something. I mean, he, he really had some pretty tall tales about his war experiences. Uh, none of that stuff was true. Uh, there's a, there's a man named Chris Owens who has done some really championship, uh, research into Hubbard's, uh, war time. And he, uh, put a whole book together on that, which you can check out. So that's, that's kind of all detailed there. But I'll tell you about two things that happened that were, that were telling. Uh, he, was, he was sent back to the United States, and he was given command of, a, a, I believe, a PT boat off the coast of Oregon. They were, they were, um, there was the idea that the Japanese could bring submarines all the way to the coast of the United States, western coast, and they could perhaps you know, lob some, uh, some missiles or something into Portland or something like that. So they were patrolling off the coast of Oregon, and for two, Hubbard thought that they had detected a Japanese sub. So for two days, they start shelling and shelling and shelling the water, trying to kill this sub. And uh, yeah, no, turns out actually they were, uh, they were actually uh, bombing a, a magnetic anomaly of some kind in the water. And, uh, and he, you know, thought that they had seen all this action. And in fact, they hadn't seen any action at all. And the whole thing was kind of silly. It was later investigated by the Navy, the whole incident was, and they said, yeah, that's not what happened. Then, because he sort of, uh, you know, was not, he, he wasn't re well regarded after that, but he then sailed down the coast to, of California, down to Baja, California, and Mexico, and for whatever reason, decided it would be a really good idea to uh, engage in target practice on, a, on a, a piece of property that was owned by Mexico, and started bombing the hell out of that, and uh, that got him relieved of his command. Uh, okay. So, yeah, they weren't too happy with him about that. And he later claimed, you know, that this was all combat, war action, and all this kind of thing. But the real fact of the matter is, I don't think he ever saw one day of actual combat in World War II. But near the end of his term, right, he had been relieved of command. So he was, you know, kind of a disgraced officer. And there was some incident, I think some magazines or uh, explosives went off on the boat that he was on, and he was injured. And so he got sent to Bethesda, Bethesda Naval Hospital in California. That's in the Bay Area. And he spent, he said, uh, half a, uh, about a year there convalescing. Now, this is all made up. There wasn't anything to really convalesce from. The actual records show he had ulcers and, and uh, some eye problem uh, infection or something. And that was about the extent of his uh, of his problems, but he was malingering there, and he. Uh, so there's there's kind of two different stories running That's in a parallel. Fancy psychological term meaning faking an illness. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. For, so for my listeners who didn't yeah, get a he was just in psychology. <laughs> yeah, so he uh, he kind of hangs out there now. Just for information purposes, he was also married at this point and had two kids. And his wife and two kids were up in Washington State where he left them when he went off to the Navy. He ends up in California and he did not go back to his wife and kids, did not maintain communication with them of, of much. And instead, after he finishes his, his uh, thing and gets, gets kicked into the reserves, because uh, he's off active duty now, he's out of the active Navy and he's into the reserves. And he ends up traveling down to Pasadena, California. And this is 45, I think, 44, 45. I don't, don't quote me on that, but it's in the 1940s for sure. He ends up uh, okay, five minutes. Clear, when yep. he went to World War II, he was married. He was. And did he have kids with that first wife? Two kids. Okay. 
And you're saying that once he got back from the war, he kind of bailed on the on the family. Is that right? That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. All right. And, and it sure. actually gets, yes, and it gets worse from there. So, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so he, he goes down to Pasadena because he is still a writer. He's trying to get back into the writing game, but he's slow. He's, he's, he's kind of dejected. Obviously, for somebody like him, I mean, if you kind of put yourself in his shoes for a second, which is kind of hard to do, but if you can do it, he was all about himself and how awesome he was. And he just had this war experience that was the exact opposite of all of his expectations of what he thought he was going to pull off. He thought he was going to go into military intelligence. He thought he was going to be, you know, king cock of the walk and all that. No, none of that happened. So he was pretty dejected, pretty demoralized after the war. He gets back into writing circles. He's having trouble writing. He's having trouble focusing. And, um, he meets up with some other writers and ends up at a house in Pasadena owned by a legit rocket scientist named Jack Parsons. He, Jack Parsons was one of the founding members of Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And this was... APL. That's right. Early stage rocket science. Uh, well, mid stage rocket science. And and truly, Jack Parsons was was really knew what he was doing with that. But the other thing that Jack Parsons was involved in was the occult. And uh, that was the other side of him. And they've even made a TV series about him now. I forgot what it's called, but um, they're they're dramatizing the hell out of that. Um, but now, Jack when you're Parsons saying the was occult. A- do you mean like astrology? Do you mean tarot cards? Oh. Like, what do you mean? I mean the Ordo Templi Orientis and Aleister Crowley, that oh aspect that's of the like occult. The, that's like the classic Church of Satan stuff before the that's Church right. of Satan became secular, right? Exactly. That's exactly right. And the Ordo Templi Orientis, the OTO, that was part of it. There were rituals. There's blood magic. It's magic with a K. Um, so uh, Aleister Crowley, of course, was his own kind of nonsensical figure and uh, infamously famous as the beast and all that. Hubbard and Crowley never actually met. Crowley was over in England at this time. Uh, Parsons was Crowley's uh, acolyte and student, right? Meaning student. And he was really into this black magic stuff. The other thing that Jack Parsons was into was sharing his house with all kinds of odd people, right? Pseudoscience believers, gypsies, fortune tellers. He loved all that kind of stuff. He just loved it. And he had this really big... My my listeners like to remind people that gypsy isn't a term we we use today sometimes because people find it... Oh, sure. But but that's not to correct you. It's just, I don't want my listeners to get mad at me, so... Fair enough. Keep going, met, keep going. Keep going. Yeah. I just met nomadic people who are not yeah. really tied down by anything and have some it's pretty interesting beliefs. We know so. what you mean when you say it, but we're right. not supposed to say it. So fair enough. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh so this house that that uh, that L. Ron Hubbard arrived to uh to meet Jack Parsons and find a place to to stay for a little while because he was kind of out of a home because he wasn't willing to go back to Washington and get back to a normal life. That wasn't Hubbard's thing. He he wasn't into going back to that family. He wasn't a family man that way. So he arrives here and Jack Parsons takes him in. He finds him to be a flamboyant, interesting character. And of course, at this point now, uh, trying to ingratiate himself with Parsons, get this free, you know, have a have a cheap place to stay. Um, he uh, starts telling all these tall tales about his history, his war record, etc. And uh, Jack Parsons had a girlfriend named uh, Sarah, and um, <laughs> Jack was also unconventional for the 1940s into open relationships. So he was kind of like, you know, free love, all that. He was, he was kind of down with that. So Hubbard comes in and says, oh yeah? Well, this girl you're hooked up with is kind of cute. I think I want her. And he starts moving in on her and gets her to, uh, to you know, kind of couple with him, with, him, with Hubbard. Uh, so he basically steals Jack's girl, <laughs> and, and so to speak, because Jack was a little jealous. He was. He, we know a lot of this because Jack kept journals. Hubbard talks about this period a little bit. Um, they, you know, the church has whitewashed all of this, but um, but but Hubbard 
actually got involved in occult practices at this house with Jack Parsons, and they engaged in sex magic rituals involving blood and, and masturbation and sexual practices. And I, you know, again, I don't want to go into all the gory details because it's kind of complicated and very weird. Um, but that much of it gives you the flavor of what life was like at this house. And, and just, to, just to draw a couple more parallels, uh, we know that when Joseph Smith was a young boy, he, he heard about Sally Chase, a, a glass licker. He learned about Lumen Walters, you know, a, a charlatan that would come into the community. And, what, you know, what we have here also as a parallel is kind of like the young, aspiring, eventual religious founder finding mentors in various, you know, various different sort of approaches to being a charlatan, let's just say, and that that's often how they get, learn some skills, get the training, catch the vision for, for how they might be able to uh, influence people, let's just say, not to mention the kind of some of the sexual explorations we're, we're see, I guess I'm just saying I'm seeing a lot of similarities between Hubbard and Joseph Smith, even, even into this part of the story. Of course. Yeah, and for sure. It's, it's, it's so interesting, the, the, the foundational events that happen in these people's and cult leaders' lives and how it directs them to where they end up going. Yeah. So, um, all right. So he steals... Steals, steals Jack's girl. girl. Yeah. Now there's now, but but it gets better. Now somewhere, and I'm not sure. I've never been able to figure out exactly when, but somewhere along the line, Hubbard learned how to hypnotize people, and he was actually good at it. So that was a skill that he also obtained during this time period or or before it. I think it was here. I think it was around this time or or just before. But uh, but nobody's really clear on on exactly precisely when he learned how to do it. But everybody knows uh, and commented on the fact that he could. And he would do it as a party trick. You know, he'd wrap a towel around his head. He told stories about this. And he said it was actually very, very easy to do. And he would comment in some of his lectures about how uh, easy it would be to fool people. And it was interesting because he was doing that and commenting on it at the same time. But he was anyway, but the way he presented Dianetics, it seemed like he was talking about that, but he was presenting Dianetics as a foil or a counter to hypnotism. And yet, anyway, we'll get to that, but that's exactly what he was doing to people. So it needs to be noted that he had that skill and it was something that he was actually good at. And this, uh, this is very reminiscent of Joseph Smith's fortune, so his treasure digging, glass looking where he would convince people that he had the ability to find buried treasure when he never did. But he knew that he had the power to make people believe that he had the power <laughs> to exactly. find buried treasure. So it's that learning well, that can have undue influence on people and then figuring out how to make a living off of that, basically. Precisely. And I have to note, I didn't bring this up earlier, but just because you brought up the treasure hunting thing, I have to mention that Hubbard famously was involved in his 20s, right, out of, right after college, uh, in a voyage to, I think, Puerto Rico to uh, find buried treasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a total mess. It was a complete disaster. They turned around before they even got there or, or, bear, or got there and hardly anybody was left. And it was just, a, the whole thing was a, a, was a mess. Uh, Hubbard was a very poor organizer. He always was. He had, he had very little business sense. He had very poor organizational skills. And he spent money as fast as he got it. He was that kind of a personality. He would always just sort of, I'll glow it right. I'll get more money somehow. And he always somehow managed to pull stuff off. Uh, but there were times during this time period, especially during the 1940s, where Hubbard really was on the skids uh, and really almost completely you know, dead broke. So he was struggling during this time. So Parsons was a way he thought he'd you know, be able to stop struggling. Um, Okay, so he gets involved in the sex magic stuff. Now, there is evidence uh, from Hubbard's personal writings during this time that were uncovered decades later that Hubbard actually believed in this magic stuff too, or at least in the aspect of a guardian spirit. Because uh, why would you write about that in your private papers that you would never expect to have exposed? Not a book, not a memo, not an editorial, but his own journals, right, where he would write about this stuff. And specifically what he wrote uh, were self-hypnosis commands. 
where he referred to his guardian spirit and how he was the master of all men and he was, you know, desirable by all women and, and men envied him. He had pages and pages and pages of these these things that he would he would engage in self hypnosis sessions uh, uh, to convince himself of this stuff. Uh, we also know that he physically wasn't well. He had he had uh, intestinal problems. He had vision problems, uh, and he would and he was trying to self hypnotize himself out of that stuff too. So uh, so the forties was an interesting time for Hubbard. There was all kinds of stuff he was involved in. But what ended up happening at Parsons Place was. He does this sex magic stuff, but he also is always looking for the angle. Okay, you know, how can give I us a, give us a three sentence description of what sex magic is? Um, ritualized ceremonies to uh, for enlight for uh, for personal enlightenment and power, personal power that involves you know. sex, sex, yes, and blood. Yeah, there's, you know, like cutting and like, you know, like a chalice and you put some blood in it and you mix in the wine and you drink it and you, you know, or you jerk off or something. I mean, there was just all kinds of, of I don't know all the specifics of the rituals, except that it involved those things. This Masturb- has been very well described. Sex, blood, wine, some type of ritual. Yeah. And with the intent uh, and, of what? With the intent of? Well, of creating a moon child. Oh, there was this idea that they were going to create the Antichrist or this moon child. And it's a little hazy because of Crowley's mixture of Christian beliefs with other stuff. You know, it's not exactly like they're just creating the Antichrist out of apocalypse or something. I mean, there's, there's, other, there's all kinds of other stuff mixed into it. It's a, it's a complicated mythological system that Crowley created. Most of it while he was on some very, very, very serious uh, hallucinogenic drugs. So his so trying to read through Crowley's materials, which I've tried to do and make sense of them, is extremely difficult. But you have a sense that Hubbard did believe in some sort of supernatural force that he was flirting with or playing with. Absolutely, no That's question about so it. There he, was sincere yeah. religious belief there, or super metaphysical belief there. Yes, he believed in a guardian spirit that was watching over him, and I believe he said she had flaming red hair, like his. Right. Um, and so, uh, so, so he kind of rode, got on that Parsons train and started riding it. Um, and, and he perhaps did it for self-improvement. Uh, that could have definitely been part of the picture or self-aggrandizement and personal power. He was very, very, you could tell from his own personal writings, like I said, that he was very into the idea of dominating other people, of being superior to other men and being desirable by all women was something that really appealed to him. This would, these were life goals for him. Um, so he wasn't just a regular guy trying to get along in life. He had delusions of grandeur. And he tried to make those manifest in the real world. And this was one of his first attempts at a supernatural solution to those problems to those delusions that's what really why this why this period is so important because it's the first time that we know of that he that he um maybe tried to touch back into that reality that he thought he had touched into from that dental surgery right you know maybe trying to connect those dots there Right. So I think there was personal interest in this magic stuff as a as a conduit or route to be able to do that. Um, didn't really work out so well, but that's what he tried to do. Now, with Parsons and Sarah, Hubbard always was working on money cons also. He was, you know, he was the kind of guy who'd borrow money from you and tell you he'd pay you back, but then he never would. And then he'd come around six months later and hit you up again. And you'd be like, dude. And he, you know, he was that kind of guy. But you know what? The magic there, the magic there is that people must have liked him enough to be willing to suffer that, that character flaw. In other words, the magic, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing wasn't the fact that he, he may have built people out of their money, but that somehow he was able to ingratiate himself so that people were somehow okay with that and still came back for more. Somehow, yes. There were people who got sick of his 
you know, sick of him. And there sure. were, I don't know how much I should, I should curse here. Um, <laughs> but there were people who got sick of him and there were people who kind of put up with him or needed him for some reason. Like for example, his editors, right. Uh, when he was writing, you know, they kind of put up with his nonsense and some other writers loved him and some other writers hated him. You know, sure. he had a reputation. Um, Okay, so where this goes with Parsons, though, is within six months of moving in, I think he moved in in October and by like May or something or April of the, of the following year, he had gone into a business deal with Sarah and with Jack, with Jack being the one to put up most of the money. I think he put in $10,000. And they were going to... It was a whole lot of money back then. And he was, the idea was there were going to be these boats that Hubbard and Sarah were going to go pick up in Florida and sail to Los Angeles. And they were going to do some kind of tourist excursion thing or something like that. Somehow these boats were going to be useful to them in this business venture. Well, Jack pays over the money. Hubbard and Sarah fly to Florida, buy a couple boats and proceed to spend the rest of the money and not tell anything, not tell, not tell Jack a thing. And basically, they just kind of skipped town with his money. And within about a month, month and a half, Jack was like, I think I just got taken for a ride. And he writes to Crowley and Crowley's like, you idiot, you just got taken for a ride, right? And he then pursues legal recourse through uh, Florida officials. I think this was in Tampa or Miami. And ends up tracking Hubbard and Sarah down. And they're living high on the hog on Jack's money and, and just kind of hanging as though there's no consequences to any of their behavior. And uh, Jack manages to uh, get his, uh, the rest of the little bit of his money back. So Hubbard now has no money and they've got like these three boats. So they uh, sell two of the boats, get in one. And I think they, or I think they sold all the boats and travel up to New Jersey. Now, I just, have to, throw, still I just have to throw a couple things in. Yes, yes. It, says, it says in his bio that he bigamously married Sarah. So, I'm about to get to that. Oh, okay, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, this is when it happens. Okay. Um, yeah, you did. <laughs> you Again, to make surprise. the Joseph Smith connection <laughs> somehow polygamy. Polygamy oh, has yes. got to sneak in, you know. Yes, that's right. It absolutely happened here. And what happened was Hubbard was, remember, was still married. Uh, to his first wife and had two kids up in Washington State. He was still married. He's philandering around with Sarah. Well, they go up to New Jersey and they get married. Now, Sarah has no idea that his first wife, whose name is escaping me right now for some reason, but his first wife was off the, off the radar. She had no idea that this woman even existed. Hubbard and Sarah move back to Washington State. It's Margaret where, Grubb. I just looked it up. That's it. Margaret, Margaret. Polly Grubb. That's it, Polly. Well, that's she right. Deserves, she deserves a mention. <laughs> yes, big time, because she put up with an unbelievable amount of crap from Hubbard. Yeah. He shows up in Washington with Sarah as his new wife, and people are like, it's awkward central, right? Uh, it took a year, and I'm not even going to get into, you know, whatever loose details we have about what happened there, but, but they end up getting a divorce, right? It's a scandal. It's a problem. Um, Hubbard, of course, during this whole time is barely paying any money back to his wife. I mean, she's scraping an existence by raising these two kids. And Hubbard's just, the, the, just a total deadbeat dad. I mean, completely. Mm -hmm. And then he, can, then he shows up with a, with a, a new young wife and what? You know, so this was this was kind of scandalous. Um, then he ends up going back to New Jersey because he and this is 1948, 49 time period now. Um, he's he's barely scraping by, by the way. Right. He's 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 trying to tell the VA to to increase his. Um, monthly stipend because uh, he's got all these wounds and war wounds and all this kind of nonsense, and he's gravely ill. And yet at the same time, he's not really gravely ill at all, and he's living the you know as much of the life of Riley as he can. And he ends up back under Joseph um, John John Campbell, editor of Astounding Magazine, uh, creator and editor of Astounding Magazine. Now they Hubbard had known him for years; they'd been they'd been old friends. And he ends up putting him up at, a New at his New Jersey home. He puts the Hubbards up there, right? Because Sarah is now a Hubbard. And by the way, she gets pregnant. 
So this is the time period where Dianetics starts being formulated. And Dianetics is where it all starts as far as the Church of Scientology goes. This is, this is where things really get going uh, in the chronology of the Church of Scientology. And um, Hubbard wrote a manuscript, um, and this was published in Astounding Magazine. It was called Terra Incognita, uh, you know, unknown territory, right? Um, the, the mind, and he's writing about the mind. And he's got this whole sort of theory of a reactive mind and how the reactive mind is a part of your mind that only stores incidents of pain and unconsciousness that happen to you during the course of your life. And it sounds like he's talking about the amygdala, right? The fight or flight, you know, center of the brain. Yes. And that's actually a bit of a misnomer, actually. Neurology is actually telling us now that that's not really what the amygdala does, but um, really? But yes, that's, yeah, the, the amygdala actually, apparently, from what I've just read, is actually the part of the brain that recognizes novel or new experiences and lights up the rest of the brain to tell you, hey, guys, guess what? We're experiencing something new and different. Time to learn what's happening. As so opposed there, to the same old, same old. response in the brain. Oh, wherever, absolutely. Wherever absolutely. And it yes, sounds yes. like that's what Hubbard was describing with his reactive brain, right? Not exactly. Okay. It was it was much 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 more detailed than that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna lay it out for you here. Um, fight or flight is is a response to an immediate threat or danger. Okay. The reactive mind, Hubbard posited, is an actual storehouse for uh, mental image pictures that you are taking every second of every moment of your life. And these pictures are being stored in this reactive mind when you are experiencing moments of trauma, stress, pain, and unconsciousness. In order for an image or a picture to end up in the reactive mind, you have to have pain connected to it and some degree of unconsciousness, even if it's just a millisecond of unconsciousness or a slight lessening of your analytical ability or power. And he divided the mind into an analytical mind and a reactive mind. So the reactive mind, Hubbard said, was the animal mind. It's the part of the mind. It's the it's the mind that every that animals have, and that people, you know, he sort of he sort of made some evolutionary stabs, but later he evolved this into spiritual entities and and non physical uh, things. But at in, at the time of Dianetics, he avoided the whole structure question, he called it. He said, we're not going to get into where these pictures are stored or what part of the brain is operating on this or any of that. All I know is that when we do this procedure on people, it helps them. And so the idea here is that we are taking the, the trauma away from these incidents of stress and trauma and pain and unconsciousness. And he called these incidents engrams. Uh, engram, E-N-G-R-A-M, is a medical term for a trace memory uh, in a cell, in a cellular body. And Hubbard just kind of absconded with that word because he thought it sounded good and had something to do with his concept of, a, of what was being stored in the reactive mind. They were wondering, you know, maybe it's being stored cellularly or maybe it's in the brain somewhere or whatever. And they, they eventually skipped out of that whole question. But the existence of engrams is foundational to Dianetics and Scientology. This is very, very basic part of the philosophy. So and you're going and through- a, And just mm -hmm. a structural parallel there. Mormonism's got this concept of the natural man. And then in Joseph's early mm -hmm. writings, you'll hear him writing, the natural man is an enemy to God. And so, you know, it's just this concept of like, you know, your natural, almost animalistic primal self is, and this is very Christian, by the way, is very dirty or it's dark or it's, um, you know, flawed. And what we want to do is help you to become more of an enlightened human. So structurally, it just seems like religions need to sort of like condemn uh, the biological slash uh, foundational natural primal self and then elevate some sort of theoretical ideal that they can either hold you down and get in shame about or get you on a ham hamster wheel working towards some sort of uh, unachievable ideal. That's what I'm hearing here. You can tell me if I'm totally off base. No, no, you're, you're right on the line. And, and Hubbard didn't do it through religion to start with, though. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, what yeah. that's yeah, but but it, but you're absolutely it never online with religion. That. <laughs> that's right. It, it didn't starts he, as a con, you know, or as a a philosophy that that you just find religion becomes the most effective delivery vehicle. But we'll get to that <laughs> exactly. quote later, right? We'll get to that's that. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Hubbard started this, uh, and remember, he was working with um, Campbell. He was working with a medical doctor Joseph Winter, and he was working with a couple other guys uh, at Bayhead, New Jersey, on this whole thing. And they were working it over and coming up with different names for things. Like at first, the engrams were actually called like comatomes or something. I mean, they were coming up with new terminology and stuff. But get, but here's the real real twist on this is that all this theory and structure of engrams and and how you go through life and you have this moment of pain and unconsciousness and it affects you negatively because it's stored in a part of your mind that you don't have access to ready access to and so it's subconscious uh, but Hubbard said it was always running, so it wasn't really subconscious. It was really always conscious. But anyway, whatever. The reactive mind is sort of the subconscious beast that lies, you know, within you, and it will feed you these pictures with sensations and perceptions from that moment in time. Later on, if you run into that same context or situation again, and that's what's called restimulation. So you have the original incident, and then you have a later incident. Let's say you got bit by a dog. I, mean, I should probably explain this so we're really super clear about it. Let's say you get bit by a dog when you're five years old. This is kind of the classic example that gets used. One, you have the pain of a bite. You're five years old. You're in a little tiny body. It's very traumatic. You're crying. You're screaming. In fact, maybe the dog knocks you over and you pass out. Um, the dog barking is one of the perceptions you experience at that moment. The smells, the sights, the sounds, everything. Maybe a car drives by. Maybe your mom comes out and screams, get away from her. And, you know, you nasty dog, you know, or something like that, right? Like all these things are being recorded straight into the reactive mind. They are no longer going to the analytical mind, which is your awake, aware, conscious mind. They're going into the reactive mind. You're not going to have a memory of all of this traumatic episode, even though your mind is recording all of it. So later on, you know, you recover from that. You come back around. You, when you're not unconscious anymore, you're no longer feeding the reactive mind. And your analytical mind starts coming back online. And life continues. But then, let's say a year later, six years old, seven years old, 20 years old, doesn't really matter. There is no time in the reactive mind. It doesn't care about time. So, it, you know, it doesn't matter when later it happens. The, the sensations or perceptions of that incident are approximated in your current environment. Maybe you, hear a, maybe you hear a car drive by and a dog barking at the same time. And maybe the temperature that day that you're, that you're here is similar to the temperature of the day you got bit by the dog. And so there's enough approximation that the reactive mind turns on and starts going, hey, bub, something's dangerous here. You've been in this situation before. You need to do something about this. And you start feeling a pain in your hand and you don't understand why. You feel like you need to get out of here and you don't know why. You, you actually have this, this, this uh, concept in your mind from the reactive mind telling you, get away from her, you dog, because that's what your mom said back in the time of the incident. But, you don't, but you're now not recalling that incident clearly in your mind. You're not thinking, oh, I got bit by a dog by five, and that's why I'm thinking this. Instead, the reactive mind is throwing it at you. So you're sitting there trying to contextualize these pains and these weird feelings you're experiencing. And this suddenly these words appear, you know, get out of here. And you feel this need to get out of here. And you feel kind of like a dog. You know, you're like, yeah, I'm not a good person. I'm a dog, you know, because these words are act as a command to you. The reactive mind is feeding it back to you. But the words act like a command. And so you act on the literally act on the words of the command without knowing why you're doing that. You don't place it back to that incident. You have no memory of the time you were five and you got bit by the dog. You've forgotten all about that. 
So here you are, 20 years old, suddenly feeling very anxious, very uncomfortable. I got to get out of here. This is very weird. And you're in pain. That would be called a moment of restimulation or what's called in Dianetics a lock. It's a lock on the original incident, which is the engram. So that's the terminology. It's pretty simple stuff, right? This is not really super complicated psychotherapy kind of stuff. The technique that Hubbard developed in order to recover and relive and go, you know, like kind of uh, de-traumatize these episodes uh, was what was Dianetics. And uh, actually, though, the technique that he developed was just straight hypnotism. We're talking about counting backwards from 10 to 1. Your eyelids flutter. You go into a trance state. That was all described in the book, Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. It's all still there. Hubbard doesn't use the word hypnotism anywhere in the materials. And when he was challenged on it, he said Dianetics is the opposite of hypnotism because hypnotism puts you to sleep and Dianetics wakes you up. <laughs> that was the marketing line, right? But the fact of the matter is that the technique of Dianetics, laying down on a couch, having the auditor, the person who's carrying out the procedure on the person, that's in Dianetics, that's called an auditor because it's a person who listens, audio, auditor, not like a tax auditor, right? <laughs> so the auditor directs the pre-clear, the person who's getting the auditing, uh, through this whole process, and you relive the traumatic episode, and you go through it again and again and again and again until it's relieved, you know, and you no longer feel stress and trauma from that. And Hubbard and said that- that's called exposure, by, in the PTSD world, that's called exposure therapy, right? Correct. Yeah. But the technique that's used to do that is hypnotic technique. I mean, you are put into a trance. It's a light trance, but it is a trance. And you are then directed to cast your attention back and relive the incident. And you tell the incident or narrate the incident as though you are experiencing it in, in the here and now. So when you do a dynamic session, you close your eyes, you lean back and you're like, okay, I'm walking in the room and there's the dog and da, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So you're, you're fully re-experiencing it in the here and now. Um, and you go through this whole thing. So that's basically Dynetics in a nutshell. Hubbard called it a science. He said it was the modern science of mental health. Without ever doing and, any scientific studies, right? No, yeah, there was no studies. Yeah. Hubbard was an awful researcher. In fact, he even admitted it in one of his lectures. He said he was, you know, was not good at notes and note taking and, and studies and all that. He had case studies, but they were really just one page write-ups of, you know, okay, Sally Sue uh, got bit by a dog. We ran through the incident and she was relieved and experienced great, you know, relief from her suffering and no longer has chronic pain in her hand. And that's, that's the case study. And you're like, okay, can I talk to her? Do you have any evidence of this? I mean, you could have just sat down and wrote this out out of your imagination. And the fact of the matter is he probably did. So, um, I mean, there's some evidence that he might have uh, gone down through Georgia and gone through a mental hospital there and worked on some people there. But other than that, there is really no evidence at all that he ever did any kind of really rigorous study. And there is zero peer review of any of this. Right. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that's how that whole thing went down. And so Dianetics, it says that, it but says that he submitted a he paper had done on some of this on Campbell and on Winter. And so they were true believers because they had been basically hypnotized, run through these traumatic episodes in their past, and felt relief. In, in the present time, they felt like they had gotten something from that. And they were all excited. They were electrified by this. I mean, Campbell was 1,000% on board to the point that he was actually one of the board members of the original Dianetics Foundation, as well as pimping Dianetics through Astounding Magazine, uh, which is where it first debuted. So you have the article Terra Incognita, then you have um, the evolution of a science where he sort of lays out how he developed all of this. And it's a very nice fairy tale. And then, because most of it was really developed through living room conversations with Winter and Campbell and, and their little, you know, screwing around in Bayhead, New Jersey. 
So Dianetics gets published as a, as a book. When, once the article came out in Astounding Magazine, people were really hot for it. I mean, it really was generating word of mouth. People were like, what's this all about? So Hubbard writes Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, a very, very overly long, ridiculous book. I read it four times when I was in the church, so I, uh, I kind of am pretty familiar with that territory, and it's very long and very rambling. And he, ma- and he makes claims in the book, Dianetics, that this procedure will not just make you feel a little better, but it will result in erasing the reactive mind completely. Like you just won't have it anymore. It'll be gone out of your mind and you will only be operating on the analyzer or the analytical part of your mind. And this was a big, big appeal to people because Hubbard's claims about this were if you erase the reactive mind, you will achieve a state of clear. And being clear means your intelligence rises. You no longer will suffer from any psychosomatic illness of any kind. And he really went overboard when he said diseases like leukemia, cancer, bad eyesight are all psychosomatic in nature and can be cured with dynamic procedure. And that's right in the book. I'm not making any of this stuff up. He made hugely exaggerated claims about what the potentials of this science, supposed science, were. And, uh, and he had little laws and little you know, formulas and things written out, and it was all just sort of very pseudoscientific, and he was trying to put his best foot forward. And thinking that this was going to have academic cred, he sent it, before publication, he sent it to the APA, and the AMA, the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association, and they both, or Psychological Association, and they both rejected it and sent it back to him, rightly so, because there was no science there. And he's claiming this is a science. And they're like, okay, where's the peer review? Where's the, where's the, if you're sending it to us for peer review, where's the evidence? Where's the case studies? Where's the notes? Where's all the stuff? And he was like, he just blew, he just blew them off, right? He went, oh, well, if that's going to be your reaction, It was the same thing as when the publishers rejected Excalibur back in the day, right? Oh, wow. Well, I'll just take my toys and go home then, right? So instead, he went the popular route and tried to write this book that would have public appeal. And remember that in 1950, the state of mental health was very different than the state that it's in now. And public awareness about mental health was radically different. Psychiatrists in 1950 were guys in lab coats. With, with, you know, spectacles and weird faces, and they would tie you up and put you in straitjackets and, you know, shoot you up with lithium and stuff. It was not a good time for psychiatry. I mean, this was his, his criticisms of psychiatry at that time were, were valid. This was the I mean, time. There, there, yeah, you, you read about like and these transorbital are... leucotomies and really brutal, nasty stuff in the name of mental health. So Hubbard writes this book and throws it out into America as a self-help book in a time when self-help was not a thing, right? This is way before that whole boom happened. So it enters the popular market, and it had been primed through Astounding Magazine. So the first folks that were really on board were engineers and, you know, like mechanical type people, people who were into sci-fi and stuff. That was a big part of the sci-fi base at that time. Um, So they're all on board with this, and he's presenting them with what appears to be, and it was presenting itself to be, as a legitimate science of the mind that was an alternative to psychology and psychiatry. And seeing what psychology and psychiatry were doing at the time, which was either talk therapy that kind of went nowhere, it was pretty Freudian, or the mental hospitals where things were really brutal, you know, the one flew over the cuckoo's nest stuff. That was the state of mind science so people and, and, and and went, Chris, it's also worth well, mentioning, hell, like, if i can sit here Chris, and read this me? book and work with my neighbor or my wife or my cousin and we can do this procedure on each other and go clear and no longer have psychosomatic illnesses have higher iq have a better life holy sh- you know why not let's do it and so it started a legitimate movement and it, and it and was a bestseller. It was coast to coast. And uh, Dianetics was extremely popular when it first came out. It was commented on in Time magazine and newspapers, Life magazine. I mean, it was a legitimate boom. 
So Hubbard found himself suddenly riding a wave of public popularity. And people were intensely interested in this and asking tons and tons of questions. 